ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय today we are reading from bhagavad gita chapter 2 text number 17 kindly repeat after me avinashi tu tadvedhi येन सर्वम इदम ततम विनाशम अव्ययस्यास्य न कश्चित कर्तुमर्हति अविनाशे तु तद्विधि येन सर्वम इदम ततम विनाशम अव्यय न कश्चित कर्तुमर्हति अविनाशि तु तद्विधि ये नर्वम इदम ततम विनाशम अव्यय न कश्चित कर्तुमर्हति दिस इज द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू ट्राई सो नाउ वी विल रीड द वर्ड फॉर वर्ड मीनिंग अविनाशी इम्पेरिशेबल तो बट तत् दैट विधि नो इट ये न बाईम सर्व ऑल ऑफ द बॉडी इदम दिस ततम वाइड स्प्रेड विनाशम डिस्ट्रक्शन अव्यय ऑफ द इम्पेरिशेबल अस् of it na kaschit no one kartum to do arhati able translation by his divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami shri la prabhupad no that which pervades the entire body please repeat that which pervades the entire body is indestructible no one is able to destroy the imperishable soul om gyana timirandasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha नम ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्ण प्रेष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्रीवासादि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो वी हैव स्टडीड इन एन अर्लियर सेशन अबाउट द डिफरेंस बिटवीन द बॉडी एंड द सोल वी सॉ दैट द डिफरेंस बिटवीन अ डेड बॉडी एंड अ लिविंग पर्सन इज दैट इन द लिविंग पर्सन देर इज कॉन्शियसनेस एंड इन द डेड बॉडी देर इज नो कॉन्शियसनेस and we identified the source of that consciousness to be the soul so that was some indirect knowledge that was given about the soul now in this verse lord krishna is more directly explaining to us the nature of the soul 
we know that the soul is a source of consciousness. The consciousness is not arising from any combination of chemicals or from any material adjustment. When Lord Krishna is speaking here of that which is imperishable, He is not speaking of something that is part of this body, something that can be replaced. Everything in this body is being replaced and will be replaced. Our cells, our skin, our organs, eventually the whole body will have to be replaced. So Lord Krishna is not talking about that which is pervading all the body. Of course the skin is everywhere in the body, the blood is everywhere in the body. But still Lord Krishna is not talking about these material ingredients. He is talking about something else that is pervading everything. And what is that? He is talking about consciousness. Because it is this consciousness that is pervading the entire body right from the tip of the toe to the top of the head. And he is describing this consciousness as being eternal, imperishable, avvayasya. So nothing of this body is imperishable. Everything is perishable. So we can understand the consciousness is coming from something distinct from the body. It is coming from the Atma. We have also seen last time the example of the sun and the sunshine. Just like the sunshine is coming from the sun, although the sun is physically located at one place, the sunshine is spread all over the universe. Similarly, the soul is located within the region of the heart at one point physically, but its energies are spread throughout the body. So the consciousness is like the electric current of the soul. Just like the battery may be just in one small part of the tape recorder or the machine. But still, the battery is producing electric current and this current is going all through the machine and making it work. Similarly, the soul is situated in one place, but it sends its current, that is consciousness, throughout the body. Of course, the analogy ends there. The battery may run out and have to be charged again, but the soul is eternal, therefore imperishable. So it doesn't have to be charged again and again. It is an eternal battery of spiritual energy. So in this way, the soul is empowering the body. The material scientists, they are able to understand that the seat of consciousness is the heart. The heart is the seat of all energies. They are able to understand. But they are not able to identify exactly what is the source of that energy. What is the source of that consciousness that they are not able to pinpoint. We know that when the heart stops, that is ultimately the, the patient is declared to be dead. There are so many other forms of death, brain death, this death, that death. But ultimately, when the heart stops, we understand, yes, the patient has died. Why is that? Because the blood supply is crucial to the body. The blood is transmitting energy to the different parts of the body. The food that we eat, the water that you drink, is ultimately uh, transformed into various elements. And then it is transmitted throughout the body. And the body gets nourishment in this way. But we can see that when a body is dead, what happens to the blood? What color does it become? Anyone? It turns white, isn't it? It turns white and they say, yes, now the blood has changed color eventually. But actually, the, the reason is that the soul has left the body. If it's simply a going of the redness of the color, then all you had to do was to just inject some color into it or inject some colorful pigments and it would have become red again and the body would have revived, but that doesn't happen and neither is that possible. So Srila Prabhupada explains that you may say that this redness of the blood is a kind of a natural redness and that you cannot duplicate that natural redness by your chemicals. But nevertheless, the natural redness is found in nature also. It is there in the flower, it is there in the jewels, it is there in so, so many places, but these things are not moving. Why? So it is not simply a matter of color, the blood is this color or that color, it is a matter of the soul being present. And the soul when it is not present, the blood is not allowed to continue its activity. And the medium through which the soul transmits this consciousness throughout the body is the blood. That is why you will see that in those parts of the body that where there is no blood circulation, there is no sensation. Can you name some of them? The nail, the hair, there is no blood flow, so no sensation. Eventually, even the nerves may be there. The nerves are supposed to be the, the parts of the body that transmit sensation. 
But even though the nerves may be there, but if the blood supply is restricted, then again there is numbness. So we understand that the consciousness is being transmitted through the medium of the blood. So the scientists are able to come to the point of understanding that the seat of energies is the heart where the, which is pumping the blood, but they cannot understand that there is a soul within the heart, seated within the heart, which is actually responsible for generating consciousness through the medium of the blood. Sometimes when we go to medical colleges, students very often ask, what happens in a heart transplant? So what happens to the soul at that time? Now it's very common. People change their hearts because the heart is not functioning properly. You see, the heart is just like an organ or a machine in the part of the body. When you have a faulty radiator in your car, you will replace your radiator or replace your engine and get a new one. It doesn't mean that the car will stop. It doesn't mean that the driver has to change. Similarly, what happens in the case of a heart transplant, the, the heart changes and the soul just changes body, the soul just changes its seat. It shifts from one chair to the other chair. That is all. So there is no other substantial change. So therefore we know that the soul is seated in the heart and from there it is generating consciousness. And it is because of this consciousness that we are able to perceive sensations. We are able to feel pain and pleasure. And we see that this pain and pleasure, this sensation is unique to each and every one of us. We are all individual jivatmas, individual bodies. Because the soul is present in this body which I call my body, therefore I am able to perceive pains and pleasures that are going on within this body. So also you have the soul, you are the soul within your body and you are able to experience pain and pleasure within your body. But I am not able to experience the pain and pleasures of your body and neither are you able to experience the pains and pleasures of my body because we are distinct individuals and our consciousness is limited only to the sphere or the domain of our material body, that is all. So when he is speaking about yena sarvam idam tatam, the word tatam means expanded everywhere. But that everywhere has a limitation. There are some philosophers who say that everywhere means you are part of the universal consciousness. And that you simply have to realize it and you will become one with the universal consciousness. But this sarvam over here is limited to the domain of your body. It is not that we are conscious of everything going on everywhere. We are conscious only of what is going on in, inside the body, in our body. And therefore we are limited. Therefore, our consciousness is called limited consciousness. We are individual conscious living entities. In the Katha Upanishad, it is declared, Nityo Nitya Naam Chetanas Chetana Naam Eko Bahu Naam Yo Vidhati Kaman. There are many eternal living beings, but there is one among them who is supremely conscious. So, we are conscious, but we are not supremely conscious. Why? Because we are aware of the pains and pleasures or experiences only within a very limited range. We are not aware of, of experiences going on beyond. In the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains, Kshetragya Chapi Maam Vidhi Sarva Kshetreshu Bharata. He explains that the soul is the knower within the body. He knows what is going on inside the body. But he doesn't know what is going on beyond this body. So he is Kshetragya. Kshetra means a field, a field of activity. So just like we have some sportsmen who play inside a field, they know what is going on inside that field. Similarly, the field of activity for this particular Jeevatma is this body, the designated field in this life. When we change this body, we will have another field. So in this field, we are the knowers of the body, Kshetragya. So Lord Krishna is saying that in each and every, in each and every body, there is a knower, the individual Jeevatma. But in addition to that, he says, Sarva Kshetreshu Bharata. There is one more knower. There is another entity who, know, who is present in the bodies of every living entity. And because he is present everywhere in every body, therefore he is conscious of what is going on, not only within my body, but also within your body, your body and everyone's body. This is the Supreme Lord. This is called Supreme Consciousness, Super Consciousness. So Krishna is super conscious because he is present in the form of the Paramatma or the super soul in the hearts of every living entity. In the 18th chapter he declares, Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Riddeshe Arjuna Tishthati Brahmayan Sarva Bhutanam Yantra Rudhani Mayaya. He says, I am seated in the heart of all living entities as the Paramatma and I am directing the wanderings of all living entities. The, we have often compared the soul to the driver and the body to the car. 
But now we know there is another person who is directing the activities. And that's the passenger sitting behind. Huh? So that is the super soul. He is the actual controller. He is, but actually we don't know that. So we are in ignorance. So we have not been able to recognize the Paramatma. So this Paramatma is also called the Kshirodakshai Vishnu. You see, Lord Krishna is situated in his own abode in the spiritual world. But he expands himself unlimitedly into this material creation and he is occupying the hearts of every living entity. And not only of the human beings. He is also present in every ant, in every worm, in every plant, in every insect, in every animal, bird, reptile, mammal, human being. Everywhere he is present. And therefore he is able to understand exactly what is going on in the hearts of everyone. He is able to sense our desire even sometimes before we can understand what our own desire is. And he is the dearmost friend of the soul because he is sit seated right next to the soul. So the super soul of the Paramatma is sometimes called the soul of the soul. Hmm? He is right next to the soul. The, he, the super soul is closer to the soul than our very heart also. That is how close he is, but we don't know. So this is the supreme consciousness of the Lord, Lord Krishna. He is spread everywhere. So we should not think that we are also super conscious or we should not strive to reach that stage of super consciousness. There are many, many philosophers who advocate this. That actually everything is one. And you simply have to merge into that consciousness. You simply have to realize that you are that supreme consciousness. We are part and parcel of that supreme consciousness. But we are not that supreme consciousness. Krishna's consciousness is all pervading. He is aware of everything that is going on everywhere at all times. But we are not conscious. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains his own omnipotent nature as the all-knowing nature. <clears throat> he explains, Vedaham samatitani vartamanani charjuna bhavishyani chabhutani maam tu vedana kaschana He says, I know all that has happened in the past. I know all that is happening at the present. And I know all that will happen in the future. In fact, I know everything. I know all living beings. But me, no one knows. Because our knowledge is limited, very, very limited. Last time, or some time back, I was describing to the nice story of how Brahma was bewildered when he went to the court of Lord Krishna in Dwarka. And how so many hundreds and thousands of Brahmas came. And some of them had ten heads, some of them had thousand heads, some of them had a million heads. Huh? And all of them were infinitely more powerful than our Brahma with only just four heads. You see, the reason for having four heads is that the universes are bigger and bigger. And it is more necessary for that Brahma to become more and more widely conscious of what is going on within the universe. So the greater the number of heads you can understand, the more all-knowing that particular person is. We have only one little head. And that also is engaged in so many different activities. So our consciousness of the Supreme Lord therefore is muted now. We do not understand. So we can understand that even in the material creation, this Brahma is supposed to be so much more all-knowing than us. And there are Brahma that are infinitely more powerful than our Brahma, who have millions of heads. And still, Lord Krishna says, even the most powerful Brahma in, the all, of material, in all of material creation cannot even understand one fragment of Lord Krishna. So that is the extent to which the consciousness of the individual Jeevatmas is limited. But Lord Krishna is all-knowing in every respect, at all times, in all situations. Lord Krishna can never be subject to forgetfulness. This is the nature of super-consciousness. That he can never be subject to forgetfulness. If people say that we are also super-conscious, we can also be like that, then how did we come under forgetfulness? That we cannot explain. Therefore we should know at all times, that our consciousness is very infinitesimal, very tiny. It's a tiny speck of the Supreme Soul. Therefore, at any point of time, we are subject, we are prone to being forgetful. Therefore, we are forgetful of Krishna. And therefore, we are suffering here in this material world, in the cycle of birth and death. So, further description of the nature of the super-consciousness. What is the super-consciousness? is given in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The very first shloka of the Srimad Bhagavatam starts with this shloka. What is that? Anyone knows? <coughs> we have discussed it last time, a couple of sessions back. What is the first definition of, of God or the Supreme Lord? Yes? The primary preliminary understanding of God we discussed was that He is the origin of everything. Is that right? God is He from whom everything emanates. 
So the Vedanta Sutra of the Srimad Bhagavatam specifies Janmadi Asayataha that he is the origin of everything. But it doesn't stop there. The Vedanta Sutra of the Srimad Bhagavatam goes on to further describe what is the nature of the Supreme Consciousness, the Supreme Absolute Truth. He says, Janmadi Asayataha Anvayad Itaratascha Artheshva Abhigyaha Swarat. So they are qualifying. What do we mean by saying the, what is the absolute truth? So they say, Anvayad Itaratas Abhigyaha. Abhigya means that he is conscious. Not only conscious, but he is expert. He is supremely conscious. You see, our consciousness is very direct. For example, I am aware of the pains and pleasures in this body, but I do not know what are the activities going on within the body. Correct? We do not know how the food we eat is being transformed into chemicals, how, we, how it is being absorbed into the blood, how the blood is flowing through the body and nourishing different parts of the body. We do not know what kind of bacteria are within the body, how they are operating. We do not know how the different organs in the body are operating. We do not even know probably exactly what are the organs inside the body. We don't have much indirect perception. We, we have perception that this is my finger. If you pinch this finger or if this finger is burnt, I feel a sensation. But at the same time, I do not know what is making this finger move, what is exactly happening inside this finger. I do not know. Again, I am conscious that my hair is there. I am conscious of my hair. But that is only a direct consciousness. Indirectly, of course, that I am also not conscious. But all of you are conscious at least. So, at least indirectly, but we are not aware how it is growing in spite of the fact that we are cutting it again and again and still the hair grows. So directly we are conscious of so many things, but indirectly we are not conscious. In other words, our consciousness is only very limited. But in this preliminary definition of, of the Supreme Absolute Truth, Vedivyas describes the nature of Krishna as being what? Anvayad Itaratas. Anvayad means directly, Itaratas means indirectly. So Lord Krishna is not only directly conscious, but he is also indirectly conscious of everything. We are only directly conscious, but we are not indirectly conscious. Lord Krishna is supremely both directly and indirectly conscious of everything at all times. And we are dependent on someone to tell us so many things. So we are dependent for our knowledge, but Lord Krishna is independent, Swarat. He doesn't depend on others for his knowledge, for his powers. Therefore, it is described that his powers and knowledge come naturally. If you remember when we were discussing the shloka Mayadhyakshena Prakriti, in which we discussed that Lord Krishna is a supreme controller, we saw that Lord Krishna is seated in one place, but he is controlling everything in this material creation and the spiritual world through the medium of his energies. His energies are diverse, infinite energies. And automatically everything is going on through the medium of his energies. In the Svetashvatara Upanishad it is described, Parati Shaktir Vividhaiva Shuyate Swabhaviki Gyan Balakriyacha. God has infinite energies and through the medium of his energies he is acting. But how is he acting? Swabhaviki. Swabhaviki means naturally. Just like, for example, if you suddenly develop an itching sensation in your body, automatically your hand goes there and it scratches. It's a very natural response. Do you have to plan and think? Oh, there is an itch now. So what should be the next step? Yes, I have to move my finger like this, then I have to move my hand like this, then I have to scratch. No. Naturally, spontaneously, automatically your hand moves and scratches. This is called Swabhaviki. Similarly, when Lord Krishna wants to think or wants to create this world, what does He do? He doesn't have to make plans. He doesn't have to make a model and draw on chart paper. And then He doesn't have to make elaborate appointments of this person is that, this person is that. And then he doesn't have to wonder where are the ingredients going to come from, how am I going to keep all the ingredients together, and then how to maintain it, that's the biggest headache of all, then how to see that everything goes on smoothly. He doesn't have to worry about these things. Swabhaviki jnana balakriyacha. Naturally, spontaneously. In the Bible it is said, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Isn't it? So similarly, God said, let there be creation, and there was creation. So when God simply thinks, it happens. But when we want to create something, we have to undergo so much labor. Hmm? But for Lord Krishna, it is very spontaneous, very natural. He simply has to think and everything gets done through the medium of his energies. His potency, 
His knowledge is automatic and spontaneous in that way. This is the nature of super consciousness. So the next time we hear somebody speaking this philosophy that you are also super conscious, you have to merge with the super consciousness, you will also become super conscious. We should know that that is not a correct understanding. Our consciousness will always be limited. Although we are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, but we can never become supremely conscious. It is only Lord Krishna who is supremely conscious of everything. And therefore we should be aware in our life that at all points of time we are being watched by God. Sometimes some people want to commit sinful activities and they will go to a secret place to do it. Because they think that nobody is watching. But actually Krishna is everywhere. He is supremely conscious of everything. Once upon a time there was one guru in a gurukul. And he wanted to test his disciples. And there were three of them. So he told them, I am giving you one fruit each. Now I want you to eat it. But I want you to go to such a place and eat it where nobody is watching you. So the first student, he just went behind the gurukul, behind the house. And he quickly ate the apple. He was also very hungry. So he quickly ate the apple and he came back and said, Yes, I have eaten. Nobody was watching me there. So he said, You sit down here. Fruit and I am back. So the Guru said, okay, you also sit here. And the third student was missing for many days. Many, many days he didn't come back. So then everyone was getting worried. Where has he gone? Then finally he came back very tired and haggard. Because he had not eaten. And the fruit was still in his hand. So the teacher asked him, so my son, what happened to you? Why have you not eaten the fruit? Did you not find any place where nobody was watching you? He said, no, it's not possible to find such a place. Everywhere I go, there's always somebody watching me. Either there is a tree, there is a bird, there are the insects, then there are the demigods. And ultimately, there is the Supreme Lord Himself, who is watching everything, even in the darkest of places, everywhere. So where can I hide and where can I eat? So then the Guru was very happy. He said, yes, you have understood. Because the Supreme Lord is supremely conscious of everything and everywhere at all times. So therefore, this is another reason why we should regulate our conduct morally. Because Krishna is watching. We can't escape. Criminals may perform criminal activities thinking the police are not watching and then they may run away somewhere to Dubai or somewhere to hide. But where can we run away? Everywhere we are being watched and the reactions are going to come for our sinful activities. So anyway, this is the nature of supreme consciousness. That it is conscious of everything, but we are not like that. We are limitedly conscious. Of course, we try to be super conscious. Because we are imitator gods. The reason we are here in this material world is that we are imitation gods. God is the only controller, enjoyer and proprietor. But we have tried to usurp that position and that is why Krishna sent us to the material world. Okay, you want to imitate me? You want to be false lords? Okay, go on to this material world and try to imagine, live in a dream world. Go on. So we come here and we try to be supremely conscious, but it's not possible. You are seeing... Uh, there are many novels which are very popular, these spy novels, espionage novels. What are these novels all about? How one country is trying to understand the defense secrets of another country and they send spies to try to understand what are the secrets there. Because they don't know, they are limitedly conscious. They don't know what is happening beyond the lines of the enemy country. So they send spies and they have so many electronic gadgets which they plant there so that they can get information. They can become more conscious of what is going on there. And then with advancement of technology we find that now many countries are spending, sending up spy satellites. Isn't it? In the recent a, a war between Iraq and America, do you know that uh, all the nuclear installations of Iraq were spotted by spy satellites? America had so many satellites in the sky and these satellites were watching and they were able to observe that where is this activity, where are these CUD missiles and all these other nuclear rockets there? So they could, be, they could bomb those places with great pre precision. So with so much effort, spending so many millions and trillions of dollars, so much effort, energy, we are able to become conscious of one little nuclear installation in some country. Yeah? But when Krishna wants to be conscious of everything, he just has to desire. He is effortlessly, naturally, supremely conscious of everything. He doesn't have to struggle hard to be conscious. He is sitting there in the spiritual world automatically and he is conscious of everything. He doesn't have to build spy satellites to know what is going on. So this is the nature, the difference between limited consciousness that is being referred to here in this shloka by Lord Krishna and the supreme consciousness of the Supreme Lord. This understanding is very important because whenever you go out in the world and you talk, or talk to people who have some idea of spiritual life, they will always talk this philosophy about being one with the cosmic, cosmic consciousness. So we should be very clear. We are one in quality. 
but we are not one in the quantity. This is called achintya bheda abheda tattva, which means simultaneously we are one and different. So we are part and parcel of that consciousness. So once we have understood now the nature of that consciousness, of the Supreme Consciousness and the difference between our consciousness and His consciousness, let us further study the nature of our consciousness. You see, the soul is pure consciousness. But when it comes into the material atmosphere, it gets polluted. And then it's covered over by so many material coverings, so many designations. It becomes contaminated. Just like rainwater is originally very pure. But when it comes into contact with the mud on the floor, it becomes dirty. It appears to be dirty. But actually water is always pure. Similarly, the soul is always pure. And the consciousness is also pure. But when it gets covered over by a material body, then it becomes polluted. Polluted by what? Polluted by many false designations. These false designations are called Maya. They are wrong designations because we are the soul, we are not this body. But somehow or the other we call ourselves man, woman, Brahman, Shudra, Indian, Pakistani, Tamilian, Maharashtrian, this, that and the other. So these are all wrong designations. The real pure consciousness is I am the eternal soul. So, even in our situation we find that our state of consciousness even now is being covered over by different stages of consciousness. In the scripture, four stages of consciousness are described. We are commonly aware of three of those stages. What are they? One is called Jagrati. Jagrati means the state of wakefulness. Now, at least I hope all of you are awake. So, this is called a state of wakefulness. State of wakefulness means you are aware what is going on exactly around you. The second state of consciousness is called Swapna. Swapna means it is sleep, but dream state. You are dreaming, having nice dreams, or maybe nightmare also. So that is called a Swapna state of consciousness, which is different from the Jagrati state. And there is a third state of consciousness, which is called Sushupti. Sushupti means deep sleep. Now you have moved on into deep sleep, and you are you're not even in the dream state. So what is the difference between these three states of consciousness? That in the first state, the consciousness is very acute, is very alert. But as you go into dream state or swapna, the consciousness becomes a little subdued. And as you move into deep sleep or sushupti, it becomes even more covered over. It becomes camouflaged. So it becomes even more deeper set. So this is the process of how consciousness is going on. We are only aware of these three states of consciousness. I will come to the fourth state later on. So in this way we are only experiencing these three states. We are either awake or we are dreaming or we are asleep. And that is going on. And what is death? Death is nothing but extended sleep. That's all. Death means that you have just left this body and your consciousness is now in a, sleep of, in a state of deep sushupti for a couple of months till it awakens to another term of bodily engagement where the soul will again be once again imprisoned in, the, in another material body and in that process when the soul is in deep sleep in human life for example it has to be in the mother's womb for seven months non-stop and that is a great engagement I think I described to you when we were describing the shloka that the consciousness is slowly evolving from within the womb of the mother. The soul is already present in the mother's womb from the time of conception and around the soul the fetus is developing. This is described by Lord Kapila Dev to his mother Devahuti in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The biological ingredients of the fetus are being developed automatically because of the presence of the soul. And in this way the uh, body of the uh, child within the mother's womb is growing. But the consciousness is still very subdued. It is like when we are in an operation theater and the surgeon has given us some chloroform and we are unconscious. So the baby is in that condition. The child is unconscious, but actually the consciousness is there, but it is covered over very deeply. So for the first seven months it is described that the child is not conscious of external surroundings. And at the seventh month, the consciousness awakens. The child wakes up and looks around and is confused. Everywhere he sees darkness. And everywhere is only suffering like anything. The worms in the mother's stomach are eating into the tender skin. 
the pungent food that is taken in by the mother, that is also burning the tender skin of the child. Whenever the mother moves here and there, the baby is being tossed around in the mother's womb here and there. And furthermore, it is being cramped up in that place, in a small confines of the womb for so long, for so many months. So it is feeling very uncomfortable. <clears throat> and so much so, that he prays to the Lord, that please release me from this hell. I promise you when I come out of this womb, I will become your devotee. But when the child comes out of the mother's womb, then he forgets, comes into Maya. He comes out crying and then he gets entangled in Maya. So this is how the consciousness is getting, is transformed. For first many months, the consciousness lies subdued, but it doesn't mean that the consciousness has been destroyed. Lord Krishna is stating here that that consciousness is imperishable, avyaya. Avyaya means that which cannot be destroyed. Even death cannot destroy that consciousness. Na hanyate hanyamane sharire. Even when the body is destroyed, the soul and, the, and its symptom, that is the consciousness, always remains. So death is nothing but deep sleep for some time till you awaken again in another body. Hmm? Just like sometimes if somebody is kidnapped in his sleep and he wakes up and finds himself somewhere else. Huh? So he's woken up only to find himself somewhere else. Similarly, you die and you die to this body and you wake up to find yourself in some other body. That's exactly like that. According to a karma, karma na deva netrena, we will get another suitable material body. So this is how the consciousness is being transformed. But consciousness can never be annihilated. So now the question is, which of these three is the proper or the true state of consciousness? Now you are sitting here listening to Bhagavad Gita lecture and you think this is reality. And nothing else is reality. But when you go home and you lie in your bed and in a dream, you dream that yes, you are a king and it is so pleasant, you have so many subjects, nice palace, so much wealth, everything is nice and wonderful. And when you are dreaming that you are the king, does it seem false? Do you remember that you were sitting just in the previous evening in the Bhagavad Gita lecture? Do you remember that? You don't remember. You have forgotten. You are not conscious of your existence in the wakeful state, in the uh, Jagrati state. You are as good as dead to that. You don't know anything except the fact that you are a king. That's all you know when you are dreaming that you are a king. Isn't it? For a person who is dreaming he is a king, he doesn't think he is dreaming. He thinks this is real. I am the king. Only when he wakes up does he realize, oh, well, he laughs it off. No, no I was not the king. I am just a simple person and tomorrow today I have to reach my office at 9.30 in the morning. So, when you are in the dream state, you forget your wakeful state. When you are in the wakeful state, you forget the dream state. Isn't it? And when you drift off into deep sleep, then what happens? No king, nothing. No Bhagavad Gita lecture, nothing. Everything is simply quiet. Then what do you do? What is real then? When you are in deep sleep state, you don't remember your dream state, you don't remember your wakeful state. So when you are in any one of these three states, you forget the other two. So which is the real state? There is a very nice story in this regard which I like to keep saying, because such a nice little example. Once upon a time, there was a king. And this king had a dream. He dreamt that he was a butterfly. And he was going in a garden. And he was hopping from one flower to another flower. And he was sucking the nectar from each flower. And in this way he was enjoying very nicely. So many beautiful gardens. And the scene was very realistic. Very realistic. And then the king woke up from his dream. And so realistic had the dream been that the king was nonplussed. He was thinking, he went into deep thought which disturbed him a great deal. And so disturbed did he become that immediately in the middle of the night he summoned all his ministers to his bedroom. And he said, come here immediately. And they all came in a great fear wondering what was going to happen. And then he said, now very gravely, I have one question to ask all of you. But before that I will pose the problem before you. The problem is this. Last night I dreamt that I was a butterfly. And the dream was very realistic. But now that I have woken up, there is one thought that is troubling me very deeply. And I want you to solve that. And the thought is this. That the dream was so realistic that I am beginning to wonder. Am I the king who dreamt that he is the butterfly? Or am I the butterfly who is dreaming now that he is the king? And that you are also part of my dream, all of you ministers. Which is true. And I want you to tell me now. You can discuss for some time. And if you don't give me the answer, I will chop your head off. So all of them were trembling. 
they had been used to giving advice on matters of government, military affairs and whom to conquer and whom not to conquer. And in the middle of the night, the king comes and asks them about whether he is a butterfly or a king. Now this is something very strange. So they were not accustomed to these things. So they become very fearful. Now supposing you are one of the ministers, what would you reply? Anyone? What would you reply? Remember the sword is there, ready. And the head can be chopped off any time. Yes? That's one answer, neither the butterfly nor the king. Anyone else? Yes? Night dream and day dream. Okay, anyone else? Both are dreams. So all three answers that I've been given are all correct. Actually speaking, the king is neither the king nor the butterfly. Sometimes you dream and in your dream you sleep and then you dream again in that dream. Isn't it? You wonder that in your dream you're thinking, now I'm a king and I'm going to sleep on my soft bed and as a king I have fallen asleep and as a king I have dreamt that this, this, this and this. So there is a dream within a dream. So is there any substantial difference between a dream or a dream within a dream? They're all the same. It's all illusion. So what difference does it make whether there is a dream within a dream or a dream? A dream within a dream is a dream. Huh? So therefore it's all illusion. So actually the king is not the king, he is the Jeevatma, he is the eternal soul who is presently occupying the body of that king and he wrongly identifies himself out of Maya thinking I am the king and these are my ministers and I have the power to chop their heads off. And when he was dreaming, he was thinking I am the butterfly and these flowers are so wonderful and I am hopping from flower to flower. So both states are false. From the state of view, from the point of view of the dream state, the Jagrati and the Sushupti are false. From the point of view of Jagrati, the Swapna and Sushupti are false. From the point of view of Sushupti, Jagrati and Swapna are false. So, what is that point of view from which all three are false and which is real? Is there a state of consciousness that is real? That is the, the consciousness that I am the Jeevatma. I am the eternal soul. And all these three states of consciousness, Jagrati, Swapna and Sushupti, are simply temporary changes of my state of consciousness. They are being expressed through the medium of the body. Depending on the condition of the body, sometimes I am wakeful, sometimes I am dreaming, sometimes I am awake, I am asleep and so on. And that state is called the state of Samadhi, or also called the state of Turiya. That is the state of higher consciousness, our natural consciousness. And we have to come to that platform of consciousness because that is the only reality. When we begin to understand that I am not this body, I am not the mind, I am not the intelligence, I am not the ego, I am not all these upadhi. Upadhi means designations. I am none of these things. I am simply eternal servant of the Lord. <clears throat> that is the relation between the individual consciousness and the super consciousness. We are not the super consciousness, but we are eternal servants of the supreme conscious being Lord Krishna. And therefore the perfection of our consciousness is to render service, because a servant must serve. So, how should we wake up? What is the state of coming to that fourth state of consciousness? Simply by performing activity that is in relation to that state of consciousness. What is that? Devotional service to the Lord. When you begin serving the Lord, even though now we are not, we don't have strong faith that we are servants of the Lord, we still think we are Lord and Master of this world. But by the simple process of serving God through so many different ways, principally the process of Shravanam Kirtanam, which means hearing the name of God, hearing the pastimes, hearing His glories and chanting them, automatically what happens? We rise beyond the limitations of these three states and we come to understand and actually, I am the pure spirit soul, I am part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna. I, am, I have nothing to do with these three states of consciousness. I have nothing to do with this body. And the easiest way to discharge devotional service is to chant the holy names. Particularly in this Kali Yuga, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. By chanting this Mahamantra, automatically we wake up to our eternal consciousness. Just like when a man is dreaming or sleeping, or a man is talking in his sleep, what do you do? Somebody shouts, immediately he wakes up, isn't it? Or some noise is made. Similarly, even just like the material body is woken up by material sound, 
the soul which is spiritual which is sleeping right now inside the heart the spiritual soul can be woken up by spiritual sound vibration which is the name of god so automatically by chanting the spiritual sound vibration you will regain your original spiritual consciousness and what is the proof that this maha mantra can regain your original consciousness the proof is it works right sometimes people challenge this is just hypnotism i can chant anything but if you try chanting coca cola coca cola or baba black sheep had so many things you try chanting it will not work in fact you will not be able to chant for more than a few hours but devotees have been chanting hari krishna maha mantra for years and years and years together and they are getting more and more attached to the chanting process the more they chant the more they become used to and they want to chant more and more which means that this sound is not ordinary sound it is spiritual sound vibration and therefore it it is able to wake up the sleeping soul incidentally if the sleeping soul can be so powerful that it is powerful it is energizing us can you imagine how much powerful the soul will be when it is woken up how much more energetic how much more dynamic it will be in its full state of spiritual wakefulness that is what we are we want to head for that state of spiritual consciousness and this state of spiritual consciousness is superimposed upon the earlier three states of consciousness it is not that a person who has reached that state of samadhi that he doesn't sleep or that he doesn't dream no he does all these three things but he, right through in the background he is always conscious of krishna the supreme conscious person always this is the nature of the the pure limited consciousness right now our consciousness is limited but impure so the transformation from impure limited consciousness to pure limited consciousness will come by recognizing the fact that shri krishna the supreme lord is my lord and master i am his eternal servant and i can revive that natural relationship with him by the simple process of chanting his holy names by associating with the devotees of the lord by eating his prasad by understanding uh, bhagavad gita shrimad bhagavatam and so on hmm? so we also need to simultaneously perform certain other for, to avoid certain forbidden activities which keep us bound to this bodily state of consciousness for example the four regulated principles no meat eating no illicit sexual activity no intoxication no gambling so by doing these various forms of do's and don'ts we are able to slowly rise to the platform of that higher state of consciousness where we can be in tune with that supreme state of consciousness at that time the paramatma from within we are able to recognize him we are able to understand we are able to hear his voice from within and that is the role of the spiritual master the spiritual master is introducing us the atma to the paramatma within the heart come on shake hands you have been with together for such a long time and the paramatma is eager to come to you but you are not eager to go towards him so come on purify your heart become pure and understand that the supreme consciousness is there right next to you in the heart become aware wake up rise so therefore the saintly souls have always come from time to time to wake up the sleeping souls and they always chant jeev jago jeev jago which means wake up sleeping soul wake up and stop sleeping in the witch in the lap of the witch called maya huh? this is the the uh, uh, song of lord chaitanya mahaprabhu when he sings that jeev jago jeev jago gora chandra bole khota nidra jao maya pisha chira kole that stop sleeping in this in the lap of this witch called maya in illusion wake up you are actually a free eternal living entity your position is that you are satchit ananda eternal full of knowledge full of bliss that is your position awaken to that this is real happiness this is real freedom and that should be the goal of our life so that is our true state of consciousness so this is what is being described by lord krishna in this shloka here so we will stop here for for any questions and answers for 10 minutes if you have any you mentioned that uh, the kind of uh, consciousness one has differs from person to person right is that what you said well the, the, the level of consciousness differs from person therefore a person feeling ecstasy or a, a person might feel ecstasy you know in a particular degree to a particular degree the other person might not feel to that extent or maybe you know if someone is feeling pleasure the other person he will not be able to understand how much pleasure the other person is feeling is this is what you said there are two things one is that our consciousness is limited limited to the experiences and the pains of pleasures of this body that we call our body 
I cannot understand what is the pain and pleasure going on in everyone else's body. But I can understand what is going on within my body. So that is limited, number one. Number two is as far as the difference of consciousness between everyone else, yes. To the different extent, sometimes you feel pleasure for one input and that very input may give me pain. So our levels of consciousness are all different. We, everyone is an individual and each person's consciousness is at a different level. And, and even this consciousness can be either material consciousness or spiritual consciousness. When we are, we are asleep to our real identity as a spirit soul, we are in illusion and therefore we are only conscious of the body. This is called bodily consciousness. And when we are spiritually conscious, we are becoming, we become pure. So there is an in-between state that is called the state of trying to struggle to wakefulness. Just like when somebody wakes you up, come on, get up, it's time for Mangal Arthi. You have to go to the temple to go to chant your rounds early in the morning. And you say, oh, it's so difficult, I don't want to get up, maybe this. You don't want to get up, it's a, it's a transition state. So devotees of the Lord who are trying to wake up to their spiritual identity, to the higher state of consciousness, are in this state of waking up. So somebody has woken up more, somebody has woken up less. Like Kumbhakarna, when he was woken up, he took very long time. And they had with bugles and drums and all kinds of things to wake up Kumbhakarna and then he would rouse to his, rouse from his slumber. So similarly, we have been in deep slumber for so many millions of lives. So the process of waking up is also taking a few lifetimes. So it may be that somebody is more awake than somebody else and therefore he is able to feel that spiritual ecstasy to a higher degree. Yeah, uh, in the same connection, the question was that, okay, if this is it, then why during a Kirtan mm -hmm. or uh, and there's Sankirtan going on, you know, you are, I mean, when you watch people performing Sankirtan, how is it that you experience almost a similar kind of feeling that the other person is feeling? You know, the same ecstasy, a similar, and you watch the other person doing sank, doing Kirtan and, you know, your ecstasy grows, the person watching your you doing kirtan, the ecstasy. So how is it that, I mean, though one person feels, I mean, in this context you feel that, okay, I might not be able to uh, perceive or I might not be able to enjoy the same kind of pleasure the other person is feeling. But why during a kirtan or, well, you know, certain cases that you are able to maybe feel that is the nature. Type? That is the nature of spiritual activity. The nature of kirtan or the transcendental sound vibration is that it automatically makes everyone feel ecstatic. You can see when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to the Jharikhand forest, he made the animals dance in ecstasy. This is not a figment of any imagination. They were actually dancing and you can see this small model over here. So the animals also were in ecstasy. That is the nature of the spiritual sound vibration. So when it is chanted in the association of devotees and when you indulge in spiritual activity, automatically you experience some ecstasy. But because we have not yet fully woken, so we may experience that ecstasy only in bits and pieces, a little bit here, a little bit there. It is not steady. The pure devotee of the Lord, however, is 24 hours in that state of ecstasy. So we sometimes experience and we sometimes don't experience. That is because we are still attached to our sleep, our sleep of ignorance. So we share in the ecstasy. That is the nature of spiritual activity or devotional service to the Lord. Are there any other questions? Yes, Mike. Uh, Hare Krishna, you just said that the soul is in a sleeping state right now and only by chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra we can uh, wake up the spirit and the spirit soul to know its uh, true identity. Then in this sleeping state, who is dreaming all these dreams and how is it that our normal activities are going on and we identify ourselves so much with the body and who is this person who is thinking that I am the body? That is a soul. But when we talk about asleep, we don't mean asleep in the bodily sense. When you are asleep in the bodily sense, you are not conscious of what is going on. But when I say, I refer to the sleep of the soul, it means that the soul is lying dormant, unaware of its real position, unaware of who he really is. And in that situation, he is not awakened to his full potential, his Satchit Ananda potential. The soul is Satchit Ananda, eternal, full of knowledge, full of bliss. But right now we are not experiencing that bliss because we have not awakened to our full potential. And even in that dormant state, the soul is so powerful, it is able to power the whole body. Correct? So how much more powerful the soul will be when it is awakened to its full potential? 
by chanting the maha mantra that is why we find that devotees of the lord they they perform remarkable feats sometimes simply out of spiritual energy although the body is in a very bad condition but they do many things sometimes simply out of spiritual energy and the soul is pure so what we are doing now is to simply awaken the soul or the soul to its full potential that is the process of krishna consciousness and it is not as prabhupada has said in his famous lecture it is not an artificial imposition upon the soul it is the original this krishna consciousness this devotional service to the lord is the original energy of the living entity and what we are doing by chanting the hare krishna maha mantra is only to reawaken that original state of consciousness which is already there like when you wake up a sleeping person it is not that you are giving him life the potential for a wakefulness is already there in that individual you are just making the conditions favorable for him to wake up by making a noise isn't it similarly we are also trying to make conditions favorable for the soul to wake up by removing all the impurities in the heart so that the soul can wake up and understand i am satchidananda eternal part and parcel of krishna and my only duty in life is to serve krishna and to love him are there any other questions one question and then if the darshan opens in the meanwhile we will continue the question one or two questions after the darshan <coughs> it is uh, said in the bhagavatam i think that the soul individual soul the size the dimension is described as being very very small tiny yes in terms of tip of a hair or something fraction now that very very small entity you know activates our entire body we have consciousness and we have relationship with the world and all that and then we also have the super soul which is infinitesimally so large and so on. i mean what what is the role that that soul plays i mean the super it, soul i mean in terms of is there any dimension or anything like that or is there something limitless no, the, so, we, the soul or the super soul super soul i'm talking the super soul within the body it has the size of your thumb krishna is the size of your thumb according to the size of your body so in an ant's body he is in the size of the ant's thumb in our body he is in the size of our thumb and the super the atma is right next to it now next to the super soul but but he is all powerful although he is only uh, apparently takes that size but he is still omnipotent omni omnipresent omniscient yeah. and one more thing i wanted to say that when we do our chanting we say we must hear the yes sound vibrations yes actually who hears the sound vibrations did the super soul hears the sound vibrations or is it uh, our own uh, dormant uh, you know soul that is getting activated who is actually the both because of course the super soul is hearing everything even when you may be chanting mechanically and you may not be hearing but the super soul is always hearing but when we say attentive chanting it means that you must also hear yeah that you must become aware that yes i am chanting the hare krishna maha mantra that means we become aware and the soul becomes aware of this transcendental sound vibration mm-hmm. so we will continue with one or two questions after the darshan just for 10 minutes now so please uh, feast your eyes on this wonderful darshan of the of the lordship shri shri radha gopinath when the paramatma is all pervading and infinite how do we limit him in terms of space by saying no he is dumb so the moment you give him a space and the location it's not all pervading it goes uh, paradoxical you see lord krishna although he is at one place physically he is still all pervading this appears very contradictory but actually absolute truth means him in whom all contradictions are resolved that is the meaning of absolute so in what way is he actually all pervading number 1 he is all pervading in his impersonal aspect as brahman brahma jyoti as in his impersonal just like the sun although it is at one place through the medium of the sunshine which is its impersonal representation the sun is still present everywhere all through the universe similarly lord krishna although he is in the material in the spiritual world at one point he still spreads out himself everywhere through his spiritual energies that is called a brahman which the gyanis go after however there is another form also in which lord krishna is all pervading that is called the parmatma form within the material world this parmatma feature of the lord i mentioned in the course of the lecture that he is present in the heart of every living entity 
But Brahma ji in the Brahma Samhita further describes Andantarastha Parmanu Charantarastham. He says not only is he present in the heart of every living entity, he is also present in every atom. And he is also present in the space between two atoms. So in that sense, Lord Krishna is all pervading as the Paramatma, the Kshiro, the Kshai, Vishnu, everywhere in all atoms. So when Lord Krishna takes on a particular spiritual form, it is not that he is to be limited. To say that he cannot take a particular form or a size is to limit him, actually. But even though he accepts a particular form according to his will, according to convenience, it is not that, as I mentioned earlier, he is limited in any way. His omnipotence, his omniscience, his omnipresence continues. It is only that in order to assist the soul in the soul's journey through different material bodies, the Paramatma accepts different, sh different sizes, apparently. But actually he is the same Lord Krishna who is omnipotent, all-powerful. Similarly, even the Lord Krishna personally, as you saw in the darshan just now, he looks exactly like that. He has a particular size in everything, but it doesn't mean that he is limited. We are averse to the idea of accepting that God has a form, because in our everyday experience we are seeing material forms which are limited and temporary, and which are made up of matter, which decays. But Lord Krishna, as we shall see as we go along in the further shlokas of Bhagavad Gita, that Lord Krishna's body is completely spiritual, and therefore, although it may be, appear to be of a particular size, and he does take on a particular size, still he is unlimited, and he can expand himself unlimitedly. It is not like a material form. So we will discuss more about this subject as we come to the appropriate shlokas in the Bhagavad Gita. Maybe one last question we can have. I was watching TV program once, and the question put there was, what does still grow when the person dies? What does? Still grow when the person dies. What does still grow? Grow when a person dies. Huh? I was sure that it was a soul, but the answer was hair. So now how does the hair grow when the soul is not in the body anymore? You see, eventually that will also stop. It cannot go, they are just like a momentum. You have certain momentum going on. Biologically also it may be there, but eventually in a dead body what will be the fate of that hair eventually? If you just let the body lie, will it continue to grow indefinitely? Eventually it will also die. So nothing in this material body, whether it's the hair or the nail or any organ or blood or anything, nothing can remain. It is only a matter of time. It is only the soul that will be beyond the barrier of time. No, but does it mean that the hair has more power than the soul? Because actually the hair should be <laughs> not growing first. And the hair will remain in the body. The hair will remain what it is, but the soul will remain eternal, imperishable and it will get transferred to another body. So there is no question of comparing the hair to the soul. Hmm? The hair is simply just a material combination. It will perish, it will decay. Yes. What is the meaning, Hare Krishna, what is the meaning of so hum and why do people chant so hum? So hum. How to come in? What is Yes, it's a very common chant. People say so hum. So hum means so aham, I am that. This is used by certain a philosophical school that we call Mayavad philosophers, which means who say that I am God. I am that. That means they don't even call him by some name. Hmm? It's actually a little insulting. If I say, do you know that person? It's not very good to say I know that. You know, call him by name. So that supreme absolute truth has a name and that name is called Krishna. He also has other names like Ram. Huh? But, uh, in the ultimate analysis, God is a person. But people who follow this school of thought, they are not aware of the personality of God. Their, their knowledge is only limited to the Brahman, to the impersonal aspect of God. Just like somebody whose knowledge of the sun is limited only to the sunshine. He doesn't know that there is something called a sun globe that is far away, that is the source of that sunshine. So when they talk of Soham, they are saying that I am also one with Him. But that oneness is only one of quality. But it is not of quantity. Just like the drop of water in the ocean, the drop is one with the ocean in terms of quality. That is, the drop is also salty, it is also water, it is also H2O, but it is not the ocean. So similarly, Soham, also they use the word Aham Brahma Asmi. Aham Brahma Asmi, I am also Brahma. Yes, we are Brahma in quality. But Arjuna refers to Lord Krishna as being not just Brahma, but Parabrahma. 
He says, Param Brahman, Param Dharma, Pavitram, Paramam Bhavan. He says, You are the Supreme Brahman. We are all Brahman. The Atma is all Brahman in quality. It's spiritual. Brahman means spiritual. But Lord Krishna is Para Brahman. Which means He is Supreme Brahman. Just like we are conscious, but Krishna is supreme conscious, supremely conscious. So the word supreme is important. That makes all the difference. So we will stop here and kindly take prasadam.